if you have your Bibles, um, we are in Genesis chapter 1 through 8, and that's where we're at. And I just want to remind you of the big picture of Genesis. Genesis has 50 chapters, um, and it's broken up in two main parts, Genesis 11, 1 through 11 and Genesis 12 through 50. In the first 11 chapters, we see three key events, creation, fall, flood, and Babel. And then we see in the last uh, 48 or 38 chapters, three key people, um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So that's this big picture. Um, I want to, <clears throat> as we circled around New Orleans, we got off this bus and we had lunch at, I don't even know how to describe it, but basically they made big sandwiches and they had a lot of pictures of all the different people that have eaten there, actors, actresses, pro players and stuff. So we got uh, a closer view, um, a more personal view of the city as we walked um, through the city and had lunch. And so I want to zoom in and just recap what happened in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 to get us up to speed, because some of us may not remember what happened last year. But we saw that Moses is author of the book of Genesis, or the gospel (coughs) according to Moses, and literally we know that God is a creator. He has always existed. He spoke seven days, I, we believe seven literal days, because they're capped with day and night. And we see that <coughs> um, on the first six days, um, the following happened on the screen. We see in day one, um, <coughs> God made uh, the earth and covered by water and light. And then day two, atmosphere and sky or heavens, and then day three, dry land, plants, and trees, day four, sun, moon, and stars, day five, um, birds, and sea creatures, and on day six, God made land animals, and Adam and Eve, the first two people um, on the earth. We know that as God makes, um, he does so complete um, in its mature form, without any evolution, and This is a big deal to go through Genesis because as our, not just country, a nation has drifted away from Scripture um, onto their own ideas, um, away from the true and living God to be their own God or to make up their own gods. Um, We have a lot of modern problems. And I want you to know that the Scriptures are solid and they bring us um, ancient solutions to our modern problems. Problems And one of the modern problems we face today is <clears throat> the question of, you know, where did man come from? And as we look to the scriptures, we know that men and women came from God through his creative hand. They did not evolve over billions and trillions of years. Um, <clears throat> we see in Genesis 2, an expansion of day 6. In day 6, we see a number of things that is not good for man to be alone. We see the first marriage. We see the first couple. And we distinctly note that the first couple is between a man and a woman. God designed only two genders, and that's it. No more, no less, no adding, no subtracting, no transgender here. Just man and woman coming together in marriage. Not two guys, not two ladies, not something else, but God in his creative design, <clears throat> made man and woman for each other. And so we know also in Genesis chapter 3, there was the fall. And so we know that Adam and Eve gave in temptation. E- Adam didn't lead well. Eve was deceived and fell. And <clears throat> they were plunged um, into sin. And the consequences of sin were given by God. Basically, God told Satan, who was a serpent in this scene, that he would be on his belly the rest of his days. I always looked at that and said, okay, if he's going to be on the belly the rest of the day, he was once standing, a standing serpent, and then his consequences was to be on his belly. For the woman, it would be labor, uh, labor pains, and for men, they would toil and labor hard on the ground. And so that's a little bit of a quick review of the overview of Genesis and um, <coughs> focusing in on Genesis 1 to 3. And that brings us to basically Genesis chapter 4. So things switch really quickly 
Um, in Genesis 3, we see that um, sin entered into the world and it separates God in Genesis 3.15. Um, reminds us that he would bring the proto Iliagilium, the first gospel, a glimmer of hope, a future redeemer, right there. So he just, man didn't just fall into sin and just dark. God, in his kindness, said, Hey, I'm going to give you light. <clears throat> and, and to say, Hey, it's not over, even though you made a big mistake and you messed up. Um, <clears throat> and then, chapter four, we see how sin basically slaughters and sin spreads all over the place. And so today's message or today's title is entitled Sin is Crouching. Sin is Crouching. And as we look through Genesis chapter 4 verses 1 through 8, um, we're going to better understand our enemy, sin, and know our enemy and know how to fight our enemy. And so we're going to look at four points, the sons, the sacrifices, you could say either the schemes or sanctification and then the, the slaughter. And so um, the first point we're going to look at is from the first two verses of Genesis chapter 4. And I, as I go into this study, I'll confess a couple things. Uh, instead of jet lag, I had car, car lag this week. So I was just sleepy. It's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, like it's 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm just sleepy all the time. So this was a struggle. And it became a bigger struggle as I studied this, that theologians have a, a few different views on this passage. So I'll, I'll try to draw that out if I remember. Um, but um, my hope is that you'll be able to get the meat out of this passage. So the, the, <coughs> we see the sons here. Um, I don't know how much time has passed. The passage really doesn't say, but we've gone from the fall into um, into um, the, this first uh, family here. Eve, I'm sure, remembers her particular consequence as a woman, and that was namely to have labor pains as she would give um, birth to children. And we see right here, um, she wasn't too worried or overly concerned about the pain, because we see in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, Moses records that now Adam knew Eve. The word knew uh, speaks of having reproductive relations, or the, we could just say Adam and Eve basically did it. Um, <clears throat> and so it says here, Adam knew Eve, his wife. Not somebody else's wife, but his wife. But there's only two humans on earth at this point, so they had no other choice. They were by default married, and God made it that way. It's his particular wife, his only wife. And we see that after they knew each other, that she conceived. Um, conception took place. Every time you see the word conceived, understand that two things. One is that God is the life giver. He's the one who gives life. And when life is given, this is a miracle from God every single time. So like as Alyssa just had a baby, that's a divine miracle. Every one of you are a divine miracle because God is the one who is divine, who orchestrated and knit your womb, allowed <coughs> um, you to be conceived. Um, and right there, we believe, is the beginning of life. You're not this piece of tissue that's just hanging out there in the mom's womb until it comes out. No, you are life at the very beginning of conception. Um, heart is there, DNA is in place, development is growing. Um, and so that's what's happening there. And then we know <clears throat> that she bore, several months later, bore Cain, saying, this is this fascinating, her, her reaction. Um, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And so um, <clears throat> this is the very first time, very first time a woman had relations with her husband. This is the very first time conception took place. This is the very, 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 very first birth that took place. It's never happened ever before. She doesn't have an auntie or mom or grandma to look at. And see other, you know, <laughs> kids born. She's the first one to give birth to a human being. And so she literally declared, I got a man. <laughs> right? I mean, 
It, just, it wasn't an alien. It wasn't a monkey. It wasn't amino acids. What is it either? She got a man. And I want you to notice it was with the help of the Lord. This is fascinating because just a chapter before, they, Adam and Eve gave in to sin. They took of the fruit um, that was forbidden, not an apple. It doesn't say that, even though pictures often depict that kind of stuff in books these days. They ate the forbidden fruit, and the consequences came down. A lot of times when we're angry or give down consequences, I don't know, we could kind of like stretch out that anger and resentment toward the person we're upset with or gave the consequence with. But really, the Lord immediately extends grace, and He is gracious, and He is helpful. And in this case, specifically to the woman who was going to experience labor pain. I don't know how much labor pain she experienced, but we know that she did. But at the same time, the Lord was there to help her. And so I want you just to remind you and I just how gracious the Lord is. Some of you, or even myself, we might be facing different consequences of our sin. Even now, we do. Um, that's kind of how it works. But at the same time, <clears throat> the Lord is gracious. So I just want to remind you in Psalm 103, verses 8 to 13, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and bounding in steadfast love. That is awesome. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion on his children, so the Lord shows compassion on those who fear him. So I want to gather that Eve feared him. She recognized her sin. She's beginning to submit and recognize that she made a huge mistake. And the Lord is showing his compassion. And I just want to just paint this broadly and as big as this passage is saying. You know, the passage says, you know, <clears throat> as far as the east is from the west, so far he does remove our transgressions from us. We can say, thank you, God. You are gracious, you are generous, you are kind. So when you feel sin, you don't just need to stew in it and marinate in your own sin for weeks and months and years on end. The Lord wants to forgive you, and he does. And he doesn't say, oh, I remember when you did that, you know, five years ago or ten years ago. Sometime when I see my parents, they talk about what I did as a kid. You know, it's been 30, 40 years now. The Lord doesn't function with us in that kind of way. Most of the time, as you look at the, the history of Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, the Lord often recounts His goodness over and over for our good so that we're reminded of the type of God He is. Moving on to verse 2, and there's a little bit of debate here, but we see that there's a second child, and it says here in verse 2, and again... She bore his brother Abel. So there's Cain and Abel. So here's one of the debates. I never knew if there was... It doesn't say that um, Cain, uh, Excuse me, Adam knew Eve twice. It just says it once. So it could be implied that they knew each, he knew her twice and they had two separate kids. But I'm going to just read this. And I think it's Anne again. I think it's one knowing, two conceptions, and I believe Adam and um, Abel, Cain and Abel are twin brothers. That's just me. You can think something else, but I know they're brothers and have the same parents. We could definitely agree on that. So that's just me. Um, I think they're twins. So were they identical or fraternal? I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't say. Um, <clears throat> so there's a little bit of flex there, and we could be gracious with our interpretation there, but I don't see no twice, so I'm going to think, and but I see bore twice. So I'm just going to, my, my assumption is they're twins. Um, we see in the second half of verse two, and now Abel was a keeper of sheep. And so that was his primary occupation. And Cain was a worker of the ground. So um, we, we know that they both had pretty standard um, jobs or occupations of that time. Um, one job is not better than the other. Um, <clears throat> in fact, People in these days, well, there's only four at this time, subsisted 
with a combination of both of these vocations. And we see that they're both going to make an offering pretty soon. But I want to at least point out the distinction here between their vocations. Um, For Abel, he took on his dad's vocation of watching animals. Um, And Adam named the animals, and he watched them, in one sense, in the garden. For Cain, he took on the job that's directly related to the consequence that was directed toward Adam and men in Genesis chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, that his profession would be daily battling the curse that was laid directly for men in Genesis chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. I'll just read it. Thorns and thistles shall be... <coughs> shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the fields. By the sweat of your face, um, you, shall, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. So I will say here, from looking at this, that Cain had a hard job. They both had hard jobs, but his was directly fighting the curse right in front of his face. So we looked at what? Two sons with two different occupations and two different uniquenesses to the particular occupations. That brings us to point number two. They had two sacrifices. This is where I mentioned that there's some differing of views of where the theologians land. But I'm just going to just walk it straight and try to cut it as straight as possible for you from this passage. In verse 3, 4, and 5, in the, in the course of time, not sure how much time, we know it's the, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. So he worked the ground, it produced fruit, and he brought it to the Lord. In verse 4, it says, And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fattened portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. So <clears throat> we see in verse 5, but for Cain and his offering, he, the Lord, had no regard. And we see Cain's response. And so Cain was very angry and his face fell. Or in some translations, it says his countenance fell. So up to this point in Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, now we're in chapter 4, there's really no law set. There's really no commands except for the command given in the garden. So, But there's no commands with regard to offering and sacrifices up to this point. They didn't know um, (coughs) um, that they were to do this in a specific sense. There's no commands up to this point. Um, some theologians are going to interject here and say, yeah, God said it on the side somewhere, but it's not written in Genesis up to this point. God, some, some people say it, it comes later on in the Old Testament and they somehow knew that information. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it with these theologians. So that's just me. Um, I'm just going to go straight forth with what the passage is saying here. And so I'm not seeing that even though in chapter 3, we know that there was bloodshed because with Adam and Eve, <coughs> the coverings were made by the skins of animals. Um, that's reading into it. Um, I don't see that in a straightforward sense. So I'm not thinking that uh, Cain and Abel knew that a particular animal sacrifice needed to be had at this point. That's I'm just reading the flow of scripture. So that's my take. If you have a different view, it's okay. We still love each other. We can be generous. But I'm putting out both sides. Um, <clears throat> so, so you can just mull and think hard on it. Um, moving on, we also see that um, up to this point, there's no reason to assume that these, I, I said this earlier, that they knew that they needed to bring blood. Um, some will bring out the reality that what command, and ask the question, what command did Cain and Abel know at this point? And I, the only thing I know is to understand from what the New Testament says is, <clears throat> is that every human being has been exposed to common grace. And so we know in Romans chapter 1 that we know that God has made himself evident 
through creation as we look at the creation and God has also made himself evident within us. So we know that there's evidence of God. Um, we also know in Gen- um, excuse me, Romans chapter 2, 14 and 15, that God, not a specific law, but in one sense put his um, consciousness um, in us. We see that in verse 15, saying here that they show that the work of the law is written, the work of the law is written on their hearts while their consciousness conscious also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So we know that the written law at this point for Cain and Abel hasn't been given to them. But the law in one regard has been written in their conscience at this point. But God not ha- at this point, my understanding, God had not given him, them a clear understanding of a sacrificial system. This is not, I don't see it there. So... What I do is for Cain and, and Abel is that they recognize that God made them, God gave them parents, God gave them occupations, and this is where I'm going to land. Um, they have an opportunity before the God that made them to show where their heart is. And I, I get this particularly by Cain's reaction, how his reaction was of a fallen face. So he had a sense of ingratitude, and I'm going to imply here that they gave these gifts to the Lord, and in Abel's case, he had a, a sense of gratitude. Um, this reminds me a little bit of the perspective we get from the New Testament in Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7. We are never ever commanded to give of offering in a straight command sense. God doesn't say, give 10%, all right? Those are all Old Testament systems. As we enter in the New Testament and under the New Covenant, the perspective is basically this. God has overwhelmed us with amazing grace. He has given us everything we we need. And so the Lord doesn't appeal to us on the basis of a command, but we see in Second Corinthians 9, verse 7, it says here that each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, not under a command, but for God loves a cheerful giver. You give from a heart that has experienced God's amazing grace, from a heart that's been blessed and open and made alive through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The tithes was um, done actually three times um, annually um, under, under Jewish law and <clears throat> three more times every 10 years. So understand it if you want to just do the math and crunch it. You're talking about 33 and a third percent annually. That's what the Old Testament law says. And so I want you to also know that God doesn't need your money, um, but he desires um, your heart. He desires um, the person. Um, Because if we also look at Colossians, I'm going off the cuff, but Colossians talks about how God made everything. And part of the everything he made is each one of us. And he made all of us for him, to give him glory. We were made for him. And so... Going on, and so I'll just repeat now, (coughs) where is Cain and Abel? Well, there's no command. Um, They had no understanding of where, that they needed to do this. And so it's not about what they brought, in my opinion. It's about why they brought it. It's about the heart motive. And so so we'll come back to this passage here. Um, It says here that Moses had no regard for Abel, No, excuse me. And the Lord had regard for Abel. He had positive regard for Abel and for his offering. And for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. And so God didn't just reject the offering. He rejected the one who brought it. So let's look and think deeper with Cain. um, Excuse me, with Abel first. Let's Let's look at Abel. 
Here's Abel. He's working. He has his job. And he's eager to approach God. His heart is grateful for his job and for ultimately what God has done in terms of blessing him. Um, and he wants to, one sense, share um, <clears throat> and honor the Lord through the way he, God has made him um, fruitful and, and how God has blessed him. So he wants to, one sense, bless God back. So Abel was eager to take his first fruits to the Lord. He wanted to give his best. He wanted to give what was most prized and most value. He had a grateful heart. He had a delightful heart. He had a sincere love for God. We see in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. On the other hand, um, for Cain, his reaction really revealed everything. It revealed his heart. He didn't have such a heart of gratefulness or thankfulness. He had a heart of duty and obligation. There was no love. There's no joy. There's no delight. I think um, <coughs> maybe, possibly, I can't, it's not saying here in Scripture, maybe he wanted to manipulate God to give him more in the one sense. And we do this today. Let's make a deal with God. If I would just show up to church a little bit and give a little bit more money, God would be more happy with me. Um, and so sometimes we play games like this. But more than anything, I think the story between the two sons and their sacrifice is what? God desires that we would sincerely love him and delight in him and enjoy him and not the other, not see him as a duty and obligation. So as you look at your life and how you relate to the Lord, what kind of heart do you have as you, as you serve him? Is it begrudgment? Um, is it this is duty? i just kind of grinding through this. It's what I have to do. It's what my parents are forcing me to church. Or it's Pastor Gary. He's asking me to do fill in the blank again. Or is it my heart is a delight to serve the Lord? Where I work, where I go to school, um, my parents, my siblings, my neighbors. It's a delight to serve him and to be a blessing for the Lord has created me. Um, not so much for myself, but to glorify him and to extend his blessings to others. And so there are two ways to live. There's two ways to relate to God. Both of these men had their life struggles. One went to God um, <clears throat> for help, and God saw them through and offered thanksgiving and praise. The other one had struggles, became angry with God, became resentful toward God, and try to manipulate God, maybe to make it easier. And so just think about it. Um, we're all going to have trials, some small, some big in this life, and we have two ways to respond. And it's not one response and done. It's more like driving a car. Um, it self-corrects. Some of us have self-correcting cars, and sometimes I'm needing of those mechanisms. It corrects me, it keeps me in the lane. And <clears throat> the Lord does that with us. The Lord disciplines whom he loves. Um, oh, wow. The next point, um, scheme number three, or point number three is the scheme. But there's the scheme, when I talk about the scheme, it's basically how sin operates. But in this section, we'll also see the Lord's grace and counsel in the middle of this, which is awesome. So, we looked at the sons, the sacrifices now, the scheme. Verse six, Moses said... This, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? This is fascinating. Um, in Genesis 3, when, Cain, when Adam disobeyed and sent into the world, God used questions to draw out Adam. Here again, God uses questions to draw out Cain. He doesn't just say, you did this, you scum, you sinner. No, he draws out Cain by asking him questions. Why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? He's trying to address what? Cain's actions or his heart attitude and motivation? The answer is the latter. He's trying to draw out his heart attitude and motivation. Essentially, the Lord is pointing out to Cain that you are angry, you are self-centered. Um, we also know in the Sermon of the Mount that 
Jesus talks about anger and how equa- anger is also equated to murder. And so I, I think Cain, this is my read, Cain is so angry at God because he had no regard to him. If Cain could, he would kill God. But you can't stab or shoot or throw a rock at God's head. So the next best target will go after who is most convenient. His very own sibling, his very own brother in this case. And so um, we see that God recognizes the bitterness in Cain's heart. And that's being pointed out. And next in verse 7 God wants to point out there's no reason to be disheartened, and the Lord's going to give the second chance. And he says this in verse 7. It says here, Do well, will you not be accepted? If you do well, you have a chance to change your heart attitude. You have a chance to repent. You have a chance to turn your ways. And then he's basically saying, you'll be accepted again. You'll be made right. But we see in the last part of verse 7, and if you don't do well, sin is crouching at your door. You open up the doorway for sin and the consequences of sin. Um, Hebrew scholar Alan Rice has deeper insight that I would not see. I'm just going to read this from you. You can see it on the screen. This is this this. this Word accept is kind of what we're keying in on here. This is an attempt to capture the meaning of an extremely difficult word. The passage literally says, if you do what is right, there will be uplift. The word uplift appears in the infinitive of the verb na- NASA, not the you know space station, to uplift, even though it involves if I were studying this Hebrew class, I'd be NASA. The rocket goes up, uplift, to carry up. So you got the idea, you know, picture, that picture there. Um, <clears throat> so you have that idea. But uh, the Hebrew scholar Alan Ross goes on and says, the word may contrast with the report that Cain's face fell, which is to say that if he did right things, his attitude and expressions would begin to look up. God says that these things will be fine if Cain simply tries to please him, which could be accepted like Abel. The word nasa can be used in the Bible for forgiveness, but God is not condemning Cain yet here, nor calling for a confession. He is simply telling him to do well. Fascinating insight there. Um... But we see that Cain doesn't yield God's counsel here. And so sin continues to do its work, does its work. Sin is an idol. Sin is indifferent. Sin is actually seeking him out, searching you out. Um, Sin is always looking for something to enslave or to master. Sin is like a hunter. We know kind of the nature of sin in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Um, Peter says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So God, the devil, excuse me, uses sin and it functions like lion, seeking to hunt and to devour you. It stalks you, it hunts you, and wants to take you down. And so Cain was warned that this is how sin works. And, and to be mindful that he's in deep trouble. Um, we, a little bit, um, I'll just hit a few applications. How do we deal with sin? How should we respond to sin? I mean, it's a little bit like fire. If you play with it, you'll get burned. If you don't deal with it, it will grow into your life and it'll get worse. Um, we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, Paul says this, Therefore, thinks that he stands, take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Every temptation that we experience is common to every man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will provide the way of escape 
that you will may, may be able to endure it. For both Adam and Eve and Cain, there was always a way to escape. Um, it was their choice. God didn't make them sin. Um, that God didn't force them to sin, as some people would say. God made me do it. That's not the case. When you sin, you make that deliberate choice to sin. Um, in John chapter 4, verse, I mean, John, excuse me, John 8, 34, on the discussion of sin, Jesus is having a discussion, and he answers them. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, anyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And so I want you to see how slave seeks to haunt you, to come after you, to devour you. And so you have these choices to either give in to sin and be enslaved to sin or choose to fight it. And we, if you remember, if you're part of our series earlier this year, James had lots of input and lots of practical advice. It's more than advice. God ordained instructions in relationship to sin. He says this in James. 15. Let no one say that he is tempted and say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be, to te be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Zone and focus your eyes in verse 14 and 15. But each person is tempted, and when he is lured and enticed by his own desires, then the desires, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and the sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And guess what? In Cain's situation, that's what happened. It brought forth death. And that brings us to point number four, the slaughter in verse eight. The slaughter in verse eight. Moses records this. This is fascinating. Try to picture this in your mind as much as you can. It says here, and Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. So Cain and Abel are talking. And imagine Cain is probably saying something like this. <coughs> Cain probably told Abel, man, I, I made a sacrifice too, but man, I'm just so frustrated in my job. It's like this and it's like this, working the, the fields. And, but yet God gave me this warning. And so they're having this conversation as they're talking. And I believe in this discussion, Abel probably had some words back to Cain. The Lord's gracious. He's kind, Cain. Yield to him. Take heel to his, his advice and do well. And so they're having this conversation. You know, I maybe I embellished it the wrong way, but I believe there's dialogue and they're kind of recounting what happened. And when they were in the field, where are they? Whose turf? Whose playing field? Cain's playing field. They're in the field. So they're in the farm. They're not in the field. <coughs> they're not in... Abel's playing turf, or his home field. They're in Cain's farming area. So this is where Cain is very comfortable. He knows what's going on. And it says here, and Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. I believe at this point, sin was conceived. Uh, Cain acted on it, and it brought forth dead, death. Basically, I picture something like this. Cain picked up a rock, and Cain killed Abel probably letting Abel walk ahead of him, smashing it on his little head head, and cracking his little head, and he died. Um, it doesn't say that, but I believe something like that happened. We don't see a fight or a struggle. I think it was pretty quick, and it was pretty swift in this case. Um, so, so what are the applications here for us today? You can see a few of them. One, at the beginning, the Lord was super gracious with Eve. We see a struggle between two brothers and how they're going to fight sin. And <clears throat> my question for us today is, how will we fight sin? That's probably a whole several message, but we need to kill sin. We need to, <clears throat> we need to not give provision to the flesh. Um, sin reminds me of a number of things. I remember in California, I thought to my wife, I'm just going to make a nice bed of flowers. And so uh, I didn't like pull out every weed and de-seed this area. I just kind of cut, the, cut the, the top part of the weeds. And then I put all these flowers in. 
And Ruth, initially, there's a lot more flowers than weeds. A few months later, when spring hit, there's way more weeds than flower. And I'm like, oh gosh, this is trash now. That's kind of how we do with our sin. If we don't deal with it right away, it will destroy our life. And we see it. And once it starts little, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so um, there's a number of ways to also deal with sin. Repent of your sin. Repentance is like the scissors that cuts the root of sin. And that's what the best way to recognize sin is sin and kill it at the root. Um, you could do the thing where you just cut the top and it keeps growing back. And that's one way of doing it. And that's kind of how I deal with weeds in our backyard. I just mow them down with the rest of the grass and they grow back. And I expect the weed killer guy to kill them specifically because I'm too lazy to pull them out. But don't be too lazy with your sin to pull it out. All right. I want to close with Romans chapter 6. Six verses 5 through 13. And we all need to take an inspection and b- do the careful work of pulling out sin. And it's painful. And sometimes we need others to help us. And that's why we have the church. And that's why we have fellowship. But I want to leave you with Christ and how he is involved in sanctifying us. Romans chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. This is in a section of Romans that talks about sanctification. Here it says, For we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Verse 10. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives for God. So that's encouragement for us to do the same. Verse 11, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. This is something that we as believers need to realize. We are what? Dead to sin and now alive to God in Christ. So understand, we are born again. We are alive to Christ. In view of this, Paul says this, let, no, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passion. Don't let this happen. In verse 13, it says, do not present your members as an instrument, no, excuse me, your members to sin as an instrument for unrighteousness, contrast, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your, <clears throat> and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. God has died that we might live for Christ. Died has, Jesus Christ has died that we might what? Live for him and live as instruments. We are God's instruments set apart and to be used for righteousness. What is righteousness? In the most basic definition is right living. But right living according to what? Right living according to God. Right living according to the scripture. Right living according to the, being empowered by the Holy Spirit to be conformed to the image of Christ as instruments of righteousness in your home, in your workplace, in your school place, with your neighbor, in this community, in this city, and around the world. Might we fight sin, be with Christ, so that what? We could be more effective for God's glory and our good. Music team, let's sing. Congregation, let's stand and let's sing together.